Hello everybody, my name is Gary Bray, being as yet another uh, video. Uh, in today's video, we're continuing uh, the tier list of the subclass of uh, the 5E. As uh, you can already tell, I'm joined uh, by two people. Uh, One of them is just screaming, uh, who you've heard several times on this channel. Jamie, uh, if you'd like to properly introduce yourself. I love you. <laughs> and if our other guest would like to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Jacob. I'm just pretty much here. Yep. This is my husband, Jacob. So I've brought these two on. Finally, I I'm, having a, uh, I'm having a guest. Today we're going to be talking about the monk. So I decided to bring in them because Jamie likes monks and Jacob has some pretty good knowledge on monks. So I, thought, I am stupid. Yeah, so I thought, hey, let's bring in some people, finally, after all this time, to actually talk about the monks. So, you just want my clout. I know what you want. Sure, let them want your clout, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, you have that. way more subscribers than me with your uh, nine subscribers now. Yeah, you know. You're I'm making just... it in the world, man. Yeah, I'm just making videos. So I'm proud of you. Yeah, so we're going to start talking about the monk subclasses, starting with the first monastic tradition of critical roles, Way of the Cobalt Soul. You're getting something at 3rd, 6th, 11th, and 17th level. So those are the main things that we're going to be looking at. I'm going to kind of explain a little bit more because uh, these two haven't actually, I don't probably don't know too much about how I do these videos. So this video might be a little bit slow and it might be a bit longer, but just bear Maybe with Maybe I know. I watch your videos. Yeah. So at third I level. I sort of watch your videos. At third level, right off the bat, you're going to be getting extract aspects, which allows you, when you choose this uh, tradition, you can strike pressure points to extract crucial information about your foe, granting you insight about their combat ability. Whenever you hit a uh, creature with one of your attacks granted by flurry of blows, you mark them as analyzed. Whenever an analyzed creature misses you with an attack, you can immediately use your reaction to make an unarmed melee attack against the creature. The bit this benefits lasts until you finish a short or long rest. In addition, you learn the following attributes from the creature. Their damage vulnerabilities, damage resistances, damage immunities, and any uh, condition immunities. So what do you guys think of this as a third level ability? I'll let Jamie go first. Alright, Jamie. What do you think of this being a third level ability that the Cobalt Soul will give to the monk? I don't know. <laughs> Very helpful. Oh, man. oh, you asked me. Jacob, I don't know what input you thought I was going to have. Jacob, All right, so my my personal opinion on it is it's nice, but uh, I don't know. So with the wording of it, it says granted by Euphoria Blows, right? So me as a DM, I would play that as you can only really use the ability when you use Euphoria Blows to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that's what it's meaning anyways. But even if, if you were to bend that rule, it could be... Big I think it's good either way, Big right? Master the um, but already starting off with that kind of restriction isn't a bad thing, but it does make it situational because you already have so many key die, right? So starting off, it's nice, but is it the best? Probably not. Drunken yeah. Master is the best! Like, when it comes to third-level abilities, Excellent. of course, this is the first thing we go over. So, granting that it's something to do with Flurry of Blows, it is a very good thing because you often will be using Flurry of Blows, and the things you learn are things that would be very, like, combat-oriented things of damage, vulnerabilities, and resistance, and immunities, 100%. and condition immunities. So it can really help you out in in the middle of a fight. This will definitely be something that's good later on, probably not earlier on, because, you know, it's not too often no, yeah, that you're going to be... Yeah, that's kind of my point to it. Yeah, it's not going to be something that at, like, level 3 to 7, you probably aren't going to run into too many things that will have uh, vulnerability, resistance, and immunities, or condition immunities as well. But definitely later on, to start learning that, you know, enemies are then, like, vulnerable to ice, or they're resistant to fire, or they're immune to the charmed and frightened condition. Getting to learn these types of things will be, you know, will start really coming in handy later on. So, like, if you had gotten something else at, uh, like, early on, and then you got this later on, then you might be able to change up how uh, well this actually sounds. But this still is an extremely good thing, because... You're already getting this early on, and you can immediately start learning things about enemies yeah. that you fight. So as a third level thing, 100%. it is a good thing to get. It's just... Uh, and, like, uh, go on. I guess just to kind of further your point, one thing that you can say that would be really nice about it is even if your DM did throw something your way, like uh, 
I don't know, you get like a pack of horde, I got pack of hordes, a horde of uh, wolves or a pack of wolves, whatever. Um, which is a really mean thing to do to a really low level party. <laughs> um, oh, you'd be third level at this But, e even still, like, it depends on the party size and what it's made out of, too. But, yeah. um, generally throwing hordes at your level three party of, like, four people is not a good thing, you yeah. know? Five or six, maybe, but four is definitely not okay. Uh, but they could be good if you use it with, like, Stunning Strike, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you use, like, Floria Blow, Stunning Strike, that procs, and then, yeah, that yeah. can be really nice. Especially with pack mentality, you'll find out they have that. Uh, if your DM changes some of the creatures, because mm -hmm. DMs are at liberty to do that, just to make it more, more interesting, especially if you're really familiar with 5e D&D &D or D&D &D in general, yeah. or other uh, tabletop RPG, it can be really nice to just throw, like, a really wacky like, resistance mm -hmm. um, that your players might be expecting on someone or on something. Yeah. Um, but... I can see it being nice there. I just, early level, I feel like you just get more benefit. And it is a big benefit, but I feel like consistent benefit is going to come early level from your Stunning Strike, Floria Blows, um, even Slow Fall. Yeah. Like, different things like the monk would actually give you, well, more so than the actual subclass. Yeah, cause like I said, it is a really nice ability. I just, yeah, cause this me personally, comparatively, it's like, eh. But this also... Early level. This also does not require, like, other than Florida Blows, which you probably already would be doing, this ability does not have anything to do with your key, other than the fact that you need to be using yeah. Florida Blows. Yeah, that's, then, that's what I was saying. Like, so you could definitely proc it with other abilities than yeah. within Florida Blows. And then it also has, you know, it, it only says that you mark them as analyzed. It doesn't say uh, you can only have one creature affected at a time, so you can be using the... Uh, first benefit of this, of being able to use your reaction when one of them tries to hit you and they miss, True. then you can use your reaction to hit them. So if you have something like, if you're a sentinel monk and you have this, you can immediately end a creature's movement before they can do anything else. Oh yeah. Because this is technically an, uh, an attack of opportunity. Oh, yeah. Can I put in my two right. cents? If you'd like to. Go for it. Uh, Way of the Drunken Master is the best. No. Yes. No. Sorry. <laughs> No, not by, not by a long shot. Yeah, we'll, yes. get to, um, we'll get to Drunken Master and you'll see why we, why Jacob and I are already bashing on it. It's great at mitigating damage, though. <laughs> so, I'm overall, sorry, I could note it in. <laughs> yeah, so this is like a pretty good level thing. You get a couple of good benefits and then some strong benefits for later game, especially because you can hit multiple enemies mm -hmm. with a single thing of Flurry of Blows. So you can learn two different types of enemies uh, damage of vulnerability, resistance, immunities, and their condition immunities. So you can try to learn the things about a lot of different enemies to help out with like your wizard or something, so you know that you're fighting a character with fire resistance, tell your wizard not to be throwing a fireball at them, throw, you know, a cone of cold at them. And then, Wave of the Sun Soul isn't that good. Sorry. Uh, next, at 6th level, you get... You do, like, troops. 1d4 damage for, like, shooting out, like, Key, key blast, Kamehameha's laser, and nothing. We'll get there when we get there, Jamie. <laughs> we'll get there now. Next is the Extort Truth ability at 6th level. You can hit a hitting oh. cluster of nerves on a creature with precision, temporarily Why? causing them to become mentally malleable. If you hit a creature Why? with an unarmed attack, you can spend one key point to force him to make a charisma saving throw. On a field save, would you do the creature that? is unable to speak a deliberate lie, and all charisma checks directed at the creature are made with advantage for up to 10 minutes. You know if they succeeded or failed on the saving throw. An affected creature is aware of the effect and can thus avoid answering questions to which it would normally respond with a lie. Such a creature can be evasive in its answers as long as the effects last. Alright, Cody, hit me. Hit me with it. So, no. Hit me so, with it. I'm gonna use my new dice. So basically, what this allows is... Uh, similar to the Zone of Truth effect, like the Zone of Truth spell of forcing the enemies to not be able to tell a deliberate lie. And then you also gain the added effect of your Charisma checks have advantage. So after hitting them, your Persuasion checks and your Deception checks or Intimidation all have advantage against them. So you can try to really help you know, your your uh, party out by getting you know knowledge on things because your opponent can't lie. And you can also uh, your Bard who probably naturally has an extremely high charisma-based thing, can easily persuade okay. them to gain information or right. uh, potentially... It's kind of like a combination of the friend spell and the zone of truth spell, in a sense. I have a question. What's up? Teacher. What's up? 
Okay, so what would the, what would the save on that be? Uh, save is a d20 plus cr your charisma saving throw. Is a uh, charisma saving throw, so d20 plus your charisma saving. Uh, What's my and... charisma modifier <laughs> in real life? I don't know. And then what do you think it is? I would have to think about it and answer at another time. Uh, make a guess. Uh, I don't know, like a 13. Negative 20. Jesus. Wow. I was going to say like a 13 or a 14, so whether a plus 1 or plus 2, but you were <laughs> right. not proficient in... I rolled... Or... I rolled a 7. Yes. Yeah, so Did you, I fail? You definitely failed. Okay. Oh, yeah. so, Ask me a question. <laughs> yeah. So, Jacob, what do you think of this as a 6th level ability? I think it's really nice, just for the role-playing aspect. I mean, it does have some nice combat. Um, like, you, you can definitely use it in combat, especially if you're one that likes to role-play in combat. Mm -hmm. uh, I like think he said, you're it kind of stupid. Because uh, the Drunken too. Master is the best. It's definitely not. It is! Um, it's so good! No, I, I, like I said, um, I think it's like really nice in role-playing scenarios. And you can definitely use it in combat. It's not like you can't use Extort Truth plus your uh, original third level ability that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So you, it, it definitely flows together really well. Um, so far, I think the subclass overall is really well knit. Uh, Cody, why did I, you? I do think me? around. I have nothing to add to this conversation. Why did you invite me to this? Yeah, I, I, I invited you because you ranked the monk really highly, and then I've told you that if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be. Well, is that I want to be here? I'm just wondering why you want me to be here. No, I, if you want to be here, you can. If you don't, you can leave. I'm not going to force you to be here. Cody. Yeah. Way of the pencil. Garbage. It's bad. Now, way of the drunken master. Good. Good for you. Yeah. Good for your soul. So. Not, not for your kidneys, but good for your soul. So. The Extort Truth ability, yeah, it can be used in combat, especially because then your Intimidation now has advantage. So if you're doing this against, like, lower-level things, you can potentially stop the fight with either Persuasion or by Intimidating them. Mm -hmm. Which can be, you know, fighting, like, a combat doesn't always have to end in you slaughtering the entire enemy team. It can be, you know, Speaking. spoken, which, you know, a lot of players don't always think of because they just want to kill. But yeah, you can easily, you know, especially if you start giving advantage on your persuasion checks on against enemies, and your bard can start, or like your bard, sorcerer, warlock, paladin, anybody who has is a charisma-based character, can really start like hammering the fact that they, uh, you know, kind of like defuse the fight rather than ending their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at like, uh, I don't think suggestion works off charisma, but any spell that's like suggestion, like uh, any charm spell or anything like that. Could be really good in the situation. Even a barbarian with like an intimidation factor to him, mm -hmm. or if you have like a paladin that um, I forget the aura, but it's like an intimidating aura. I just forget the name of it. Uh, I believe that's the aura of vengeance has that. Right, vengeance paladin. Yeah, the so like it, it, it can, it can even proc like uh, things like that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, to help with that kind of thing. If you're going for like, more of intimidating, instead of just fighting your way through it, maybe you can get them to surrender. Yeah. You know? Um, and then it opens up really interesting roleplay scenarios. Like if you're, um, like let's say your DM has you on a mission where you're scouring the forest looking for a enemy scout. You know? Mm -hmm. And the scout ambushes you. You go through this really cool combat scenario. You're able to use this ability at a low level. And because you, were, you did this and it lasts for 10 minutes, combat you know, uh, let's say you have a Vengeance Paladin, or your group is just able to intimidate them, get them to surrender. Now you're in this really unique, cool role-playing scenario where, because you set this up during a combat, you're now able to role-play actually interrogating him and trying to figure out why he's not answering certain questions, you know? Yeah, it really does get, so I, like, overall combat-oriented and an outside of combat can really actually benefit from this. It's not just a one or the other title of thing. Teacher, I have a question. Listen. What's up? Which subclass are we talking about? Cobalt Soul. This is that's a thing. Yeah, this is Critical Role's Cobalt Soul. Yeah. I uh, know why. Yeah, if you want to see it in action, oh. uh, the second oh. campaign of Critical Role, uh, Mercer Ray plays the subclass. <laughs> why does it have to be Critical Role? Why would you? Yes. <laughs> so, 
it is a pretty good 6th level ability. And then you also gain uh, Mystical Iridation, which is basically just going to give you a uh, skill and a language. And then uh, at 11th and 17th level, you can gain an additional language and an additional skill proficiency from the above list, with the ability to double the bonus of an existing, uh, existing proficiency from the list at 11th and 17th level. So your skills can be Arcana, History, Investigation, Nature, or Religion. So you just choose one, and then you also can just choose a language. You know, anytime. Like, these are just... You can talk to the ocean creatures now. Yeah, these are just for free, the ability to gain more proficiency than more languages. At, you know, if you know levels, deep like, speech, six. can you talk to fish? I don't know. Like, these are... Uh, maybe, maybe certain ones? Yeah, maybe. Well, isn't it like the big creatures of the deep that speak deep it's, speech? Don't they communicate well, with like, the ocean life? Yes, I know. It's more like, I think, merfolk and things like that. I'm not even sure that merfolk themselves know deep speech. I think it's more like older creatures. It might be, it, I might be wrong on this. Would yeah. it be offensive if you talk to a uh, an ancient creature, but instead of speaking in deep speech, you spoke in a deep voice? <laughs> Would that, be, Probably, yeah. would that be extremely offensive? Like, would you get murdered on the spot by, like, a basilisk or something? That depends on the deep. Yeah. Depends but, on what you say. It depends on the save you make in, uh, performance. Yep. <laughs> Persuasion to not kill you. Yeah. So, overall, I mean, like, the fact that you get multiple of these at a time, so you can either gain, you can learn three languages... And you can either gain three additional proficiencies or two proficiencies and one of them becoming expertise. This is actually a pretty neat little added thing that you get on top of what you're already getting at 6th level. I think this is a great subclass, and I give it a F. What about you, Jacob? Uh, the subclass itself. Well, I mean, of, of this 6th level thing, because we still have the 11th uh, oh, okay. level. Yeah, about to say, like, I was going to say, I need to see more of it. Yeah, uh, no! The, two okay. more things to go over. So, so like, Mystical no. Irritation. I would, say, I, I would say that with that specifically, um, you're getting, so far what I see out of it is you're getting skills, you're getting um, really interesting combat and roleplay scenarios out of it. I mean, I like it. Uh, I think that any class that's going to give you more skills is always nice. I mean, that's why I personally love playing rogues or uh, anything like bard or, you know, like things that give you a lot more proficiencies or expertise are always really nice because that means that you can roll higher. So you're generally going to know more. You'll be more versatile in the campaign. Yeah. Um, nothing wrong with ones that don't. I just like having versatile characters, right? So that's kind of what you're going for. I would highly suggest like this subclass so far or any other subclass that helps with like, skills and stuff. Yeah, this and is plus, like... added bonus is that you get... I'm sorry to cut you off. No, I didn't mean fine. to. It's fine. Uh, I was just going to say, an extra bonus so far of the subclass as a whole is that you get um, extra roleplay scenarios out of it that you normally wouldn't get. Mm -hmm. Especially if your DM allows for those roleplay scenarios to happen in certain ways, you know? Yeah. Like, with the example earlier about the scout, right? Like, you can offer up a lot of really cool roleplaying adventures with it that doesn't just have to be, I walk up and smash somebody, you know? Yeah, like oh, this in the middle of a battle. This subclass is a very uh, like knowledge, like a very knowledge based, like very uh, like thought and uh, intel based monk, rather than like the the monk that allows me to hit more often or do more. I didn't know you could do that as a monk in the middle of a battle. Have, like abilities to actually gain info on your enemies to help out your team or to do uh, things outside of combat, like what mystical iridation does or what the uh, because outside of combat, you can just punch somebody with like sword truth and force them to tell the truth. Like it is. Cody, like, did you know this? Thing. So like, it really is a very like info heavy one that can really benefit you inside and outside of combat. So far, at least. Cody, so, you can you can make a bard smash somebody in the middle of battle. So at you can if they have a knife. At eleventh level, you get Mind of Mercury. You've honed your awareness and reflexes through mental aptitude and pattern recognition. Once per What's aptitude mean? Once per turn, if you've already taken your reaction, you may spend one key point to take an additional reaction. I mean, getting to take more reactions is always good, especially if, you know, you're like a sentinel. You know, you've got the, the feature sentinel, which allows you to, uh, as a reaction, you can end somebody's turn, like their movement speed. So getting to basically do that, or if you've marked somebody with the, the earlier on ability that you like that Like Mage three, Slayer? No. Is Mage Slayer a reaction? Thing? Yeah, Mage Slayer is a reaction. 
when a uh, yeah, so like, you could spend a key point and use yeah. If you're if you don't mage, mage slayer, slayer yeah. as a feature, you'd be able to do it. So yeah. it's like getting to be able to do more reactions, which means that you can hit people more often. You can stop enemies from moving more often with your attacks of opportunity. So getting like more unique things with that, just for using. Listen, I'm points. just trying to put in any information that I know, and that's not a lot. I'm, I'm trying here. I'm literally reading I mean... off what these give you, so just pay attention. <laughs> Or just, no! just, if you're looking at the screen, which I'm sharing, no. you'll be able to see what these do. I am looking! There's so many words! So, I mean... I'm taking psychic damage from staring at this. I should say, it's not as many as you want. It's once per turn, you can take a second reaction with a key point. I'm not saying, like, you can take as many reactions it's... on a turn you want, but... It kind of, it's kind of like action surge, but for reactions. Yeah. In that sense. Um, can you use all nice. of your key really points cool. in one turn, then? Um, you, I don't know if you could use, it depends on how many key points you have, because you could do Flurry of Blows, Stunning Strike on each attack, um, Can you truth. react to someone existing and punch them? No. Oh. Can so. you react to someone existing and throw something at them? No. Can you react to being alive and live? No. Oh, well damn. <laughs> you killed all of them and you just killed my monk! Yes. Ah! So, getting this ability. What do you think of it, Jacob? Uh, personally, I mean, I like it. Um, like I said, it's kind of like action search for the fighter subclass or any fighter class, really, because it's a basic ability you get at level, uh, level 2, but mm -hmm. it, it's really nice in the sense that it works for reactions, because you don't really see that. I think this might be the only subclass I could think of top of my head that gives it. Yeah. So, like you said, you can do Sentinel, you could do is, uh, Mage Slayer if you get that feat. Um, pretty I love much it. anything Extra. that would allow you to be, uh, like, th this basically just opens up like a lot of options with if you want to be more tanky or if you want to be more like CC support, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to be more DPS or whatever, uh, you can do that with this. Which is I really love cool. it. F tier. Yeah, and it really does open up like a lot of times with like reactions and like you know spells for other classes to where it's like you don't want to use it at that moment because what if something like the next enemy who does something you want to use your reaction against them this one kind of gives you a bit more flexibility because you can use your reaction just however you want and then there is like a time like later on in that turn before your turn comes back around you can be like oh i should have used my reaction here well with mind of mercury you can go i already used my reaction and i can do i want to use my reaction here spend a key point i can use another reaction so you can kind of be a bit more flexible and not have to worry like can you react to a block what? Like if somebody if somebody blocks your attack, can you react to that? No. And stab no. them. No. Why? No. Although Why not? it's not a reaction, you're not you're not reacting to them actually attacking. You're them. reacting to them blocking your attack. No. But that's not how By reactions stabbing work. them. That's, that's a rule book. No. Also, uh, a really I didn't good read thing, it. A really good thing with this one is that uh, you could use your keep like you can attack somebody to stop them from moving. And then if somebody shoots at you with a ranged weapon, you can then use your key point to use uh, deflect missile against it. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have to worry about which either... Which I'm pretty sure works on magic missile. Uh, Guys, I ordered yeah. a bunch of books from Barnes & Noble. I'm going to get a whole D&D &D set now. Nice. So, Maybe I'll learn things. Awesome. Yeah, so getting to use smarter. like the ability to like f you know, st attack somebody who's moving away from you and using it to protect yourself by getting deflect what? missile on the same Wait. turn... It's a very Wait a powerful minute. thing you can do there. What, you can react to someone moving away from you, but you can't react to somebody moving towards you? Not unless you have... What kind of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? If somebody moves away from you, they're trying to flee from you, so you can take an attack of opportunity because they're running away, which kind of makes them defenseless in a sense, so you can punch which them in the back. Which is a reaction. Is that why he lost? Because he wasn't the one approaching? Yes. And oh, then the only way me. that you can attack somebody if they're approaching you is if you have um, Polar Master. It allows you to take your reaction to when somebody enters your your. What if you reach, have a stand? You can attack them. Uh, one of these does give you a stand, but you won't be able to do it that way. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> no, because technically you're still an unarmed attack. It's not a pole arm when you have that. So. Exactly. I mean, it's my stand, dude. It pauses time. Uh, at level 11, you also get your uh, second set of mystical uh, iridation, so another proficiency, Goblins. or you can double it, and then you get a second language. They're chewy. Uh, and then next is, at uh, max level, your capstone of the subclass. 
you get your last little uh, mythical iridation, which just choose whichever one. Now you can speak to minotaurs, the yeah. fish, and goblins. Yeah, and then you you get a debilitating strike at 17th level. You've gained the knowledge to temporarily temporarily lower your creature's fortitude by striking a series of pressure points. Whenever you hit a creature with one of the attacks granted by your flurry of blows, you can spend three key points to cause the creature to suffer a vulnerability to a damage type of your choice for one minute or until they take that damage type. A creature who is affected by this feature cannot be affected by it again for 24 hours. What, so they immediately grow tough skin as soon as the spell ends, and they're like, Ha! Piercing damage? Well, no! That's not... That's not necessarily how it works. It's more like, let's say, uh, fire elemental. My joke. And let's say you want to give them a, uh... My joke. You know what? No, no, you're not allowed to joke. Okay, My joke! Uh, no! Yeah, you can no. force uh... a creature to become vulnerable to a damage type for one hit of that damage type. Wait, if yeah. you make a genasi vulnerable to fire, would they kill themselves? No. Make a fire genasi? No. No, because it they're not damaging, coming off of them, but... They're not damaging themselves right. with it. But this does say that you but can. They are fire. No, they're normal human with fire-like aspects. Like a. What about a fire human. elemental? Yeah, that's that's what I was about to go into. Is that you can force a creature to suffer the vulnerability of this. This does technically, how it's worded, say that you can make a creature who is normally immune to it is now vulnerable for one time. So if you're attacking like a fire genasi or like a uh, ancient red mm -hmm. dragon who are naturally immune to fire damage. You can hit them with this ability and allow for a fire-based attack to do double damage against them as they are vulnerable to it. Which what if while yeah. you're fighting in the in the mountains, like you're fighting this yeti, and you make the yeti vulnerable to cold? Uh, it is just the cold damage will do something. They aren't like vulnerable to cold temperatures. Why? Because that's how it works. But the I'm only vulnerable to cold damage, but this mountains is yeah. Like, oh, the main that right? thing that, like, this really comes up with in my head is if you have, like, a spellcaster of sorts who knows a very high-level spell, like, something like Disintegrate or something, that is... What about Power Word Kill? No, because Power Word Kill doesn't care about um, d uh, immunities or vulnerabilities or anything like that. It only cares about Just your HP. Help. But if you have something like uh, Disintegrate, which is... Uh, uh, what about Toll of the damage, Dead? Uh, I mean, you can do it with I thought it was uh, Force. Is it force damage? It's one of the two. I, I'm I know, pretty sure it's force. I know one of them, one of the high level things is just is force damage and one of them is necrotic damage. Because they can both like yeah. is there a spell? Is there a spell in D D that can change what a creature breathes? Like you could you could turn a sea creature, like give it the need for oxygen and just drown it. I mean polymorph. But yeah, if they take polymorph. one point of damage, they're dead. But yeah. the rest of the damage carries over. Yeah, so, I mean. the only spell that has that type of thing in mind is uh, water breathing, which allows for characters who cannot breathe water to be able to breathe water, but they can still breathe Wait, yeah, air. Yeah, fine. they can still breathe air, then what's the point? That's not how I kill my enemies. Yeah, I don't want to drown them, I want to suffocate them with air. Yeah, so it basically, that's, that's the only one, there's no like... I mean, you can do, you there. can get creative and use like force wall and uh... Just, what, just turn my friend into a fish, I guess. Yeah, you could definitely com like combo some spells for that, but like just turn someone into a fish and just watch them die. Well, no, because it would just damage them a little bit, and then they would turn out of the fish back into the like they they take thing. one damage, <laughs> like that's the cap. What if you turn them back into the fish? They they like, still would only they still would only be taking one damage out. That's how. How much works. damage does a fish need before it dies? Probably like one. You could just step them. You like then wouldn't they just die? No, they if it's polymorph they turn into whatever you turn them into, and once they lose all of that HP, they turn back into their original form, and any excess damage is taken on them. So if you did... If you that's turn, a lot of polymorph. Yeah, and that's a fourth level spell. Oh lord, that's a, that's a lot of spell slots. I just go all the way to, like, 20th level and just use all my spell slots on a fourth level spell. Yeah, so... All of, all of them. Not a viable strategy, but something like this where... You can potentially hit the enemy, and if it is either force or necrotic, whatever it may be, depending on what spell you're doing at high level, with disintegration, with uh, disintegration ray, you can basically then make it to where that does double damage. And if they drop below zero hit points from it, they instantly die because that's how disintegration I works. Mean, you so, can also like if you let's say you want to add strategy to it, right? Let's say you have like a wizard who has prismatic wall mm -hmm. and gravity well, right? Mm -hmm. Those are their two spells. 
Um, well, the first part of uh, prismatic wall, I believe, is fire, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say they use gravity. You're using it on uh, the BBEG, okay? And you're just trying to. You're in, you're in your last stand. You know he's low on health. You have this really big spell prepared. Uh, you have gravity well set up. Let's say you run up to him because you have evasive action, right? As a monk, so gravity well is really not going to affect you as much, right? So you could technically run up to someone with gravity well, uh, hit them with this ability. Uh, let's say that they're immune to fire normally, but you want to make sure you get all the damage. So you make sure you make that immunity. Um, you turn that immunity to invulnerability, right? Yeah. So they're going to take double damage from the first part of prismatic wall and then it's going to go through the other six layers petrify them they're going to drop back through doing another double damage so at that point even if the other part of prismatic wall doesn't affect them again like with the fire they're still going to be coming back down whether they're petrified or not they have to pass it twice mm -hmm. and then let's even like go further with this and let's say you did your depilidating blows and then you spent another key point and you put on stunning strike and another key point with your Fury of Bloods. Uh, or let's say you didn't even do Stunning Strike, actually. Let's just say you did the um, the Charisma save one, right? Yeah. So you're putting yourself in this really interesting situation just with a little bit of strategy here to allow your wizard to do a lot of damage. Um, and even if you didn't go that route, if you were to, let's say that you have a rogue and uh, this person is immune to piercing damage, well, now your rogue can do some massive damage with uh, sneak attack and everything as well. Hmm. Um, or slashing or whatever the damage type is. If you have like an artillerist, artillerists are broken already, but if you, <laughs> for some reason, you needed to make the person vulnerable to whatever their damage is, you can definitely do that. Yeah. So it, it makes it really nice, uh, really nice comboing ability as well, yeah, uh, can... regardless of where you are in initiative. Yeah, you can really cause some serious damage by using this properly. Like, I mean, realistically, like, I always see, like, the capstone is... Capstones are usually your... Either, like, yeah, as long as you're... Like, they're good enough that you're not, like, disappointed to reach it, they're pretty good. Like, this is something that when you... If you can reach 17th level, because a lot of times, like, campaigns, if you're starting at, like, level 1, you don't always reach level 17. A lot of campaigns, like end around like the 13 14 range so like seeing a 17th level ability isn't always the most common thing but if you are able to get to 17th level of the capstone and you know you get it and you get this one you're definitely not disappointed to get this ability it isn't nope. like something that you're like oh i wasted you know i got 16 levels in this class okay this subclass just for this crazy crazy idea what if you reach 20th level cody what happens to me then am i gonna grow scales and Fly away. For this subclass? Yes. What, what, what do I want? What am I getting from being this, level 20 now? Well, this is what you get at the maximum of the subclass. If you want to know <sighs> what you get at the end of the class itself, that's a different video. Oh, a new video. Yeah, this one is... Man, up. I sure hope I've subscribed and hit your bell. Yeah, this is... These, these videos and like the video. These videos are just talking about the subclasses, not about the... Um, class itself so overall this is definitely giving a lot of benefits giving you uh up to three additional skills that you become proficient in three additional languages uh the ability to take multiple reactions if you can get all the way to the max level getting to cause vulnerability to the enemy um getting to force uh, an enemy to not be able to lie and charisma checks uh, or I sure do hope I subscribe it. to your channel. And then the ability of extract aspect to learn about damage vulnerabilities and immunities and all that type of things is extremely good. Overall, I mean, it doesn't exist here, but I mean... Then why did we get Because I had to go over all of them. Uh. This just isn't here because this is an older tier. tier mm. But overall, uh. I would definitely say, just because we haven't gone over anything uh. else... I would definitely put that, you know, up here at S at uh, A rank. I think it's legendary, so we should put it in F tier. I, d I definitely would rank this as great. What about you, Jacob? I don't know. I'd argue for the legendary. Well, I mean, I'm just, like so far because we haven't gone over any other subclasses. Oh, okay. Because okay. it's like you know, you also yeah. have in mind, we do have knowledge yeah. of the other subclasses. Like, would you try to put this above Astral Self or Open Hand or Shadow? Shadow, yeah. Like, above uh, Shadow, yeah, but I don't know about above Astral Self or above Open Hand. I don't know, like, 
Uh, like I can see this I being probably, like, I'd, I'd, of great. Like I can see this being like an eighty nine out of a hundred type of thing. Like it is a B plus that tiny little bit of extra thing, like maybe a little bit more of a different camp like a right campaign, and this is right up there. But then also think, would you bring the would you bring this subclass to a dungeon uh, a dungeon delving campaign? I think I actually think it could be good in a dungeon delving co campaign though. Just I'm never going to use it. I promise you that. Because like this part right here is going to be good in dungeon related things, but this one, because you know, not a lot of times, like depending on the dungeon thing, you might not go up against creatures that would even try to lie. Yeah, that you need to use I mean, if charisma. It's, if it's a dungeon crawler, you know, and they're throwing trolls at you, I mean, you given it depends. At that point, it just depends on your DM. Yeah, that's um, the thing. It's like your DM and your and, campaign. Yeah. That's really where other areas can aspect. And of course, this also doesn't... Yeah. None of this really matters about like how well you can roleplay the character. Because you can roleplay the character the best you can. That's not going to make it, you know, the subclass itself better. That's just meaning that you can play the game. Like, it sure. isn't... Like, the, the subclass isn't good because you can roleplay it well. That just means that you're good at roleplaying. So it's like, I guess in, in that sense, with like the whole dungeon crawler thing, if you're not going against like sentient creatures, or at least creatures like you like, can actually like be spoken to and understand you, mm -hmm. then yeah, I would I would put it at great. Yeah. Um, that's in a campaign where you're like like let's say uh, any campaign really that you're having to fight sentient creatures, I could definitely see it being in the legendary tier. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's just me. I, I feel like it offers a unique role play. But fighting style to monk that you don't normally see. Yeah, this is definitely um, something that is like an eighty nine to a ninety one. Like it is either the top yeah. of A tier or it is the bottom of S tier. True. Like you either True. are the best of your rank or you're the worst of your rank. But even being the worst of legendary it still means that you're better than every other person in great. So either you're the best of your area or you're the worst of the best. Which being Very the worst true. of the best just means that you're, you know, does it really, does it like Way of Mercy's thing? legendary. Way of Mercy. Way of it's, Mercy it's best. also is not here, as it is one of the newest, if not Why? the newest Why? It's so good! But it's just not there, because this is, I believe, the newest subclass. So it's just not here, because this is an old... I mean, as you can see, Blood Hunter, the whole class of Blood Hunter, is not here. And that doesn't... Yeah, because it. Critical Role isn't good enough. Actually, all of them are now actually canon and part of Coast, <gasps> Wizards of the Coast. Of course so. they are. They Great, that's amazing. Count. I love that. So we'll probably go over this one, and then depending on how long, we might wrap up with only two, and then I might either do all of them all right. uh, separately by myself, or I might just... Can I try to other. explain to you why Way of Mercy is great? Uh, we're going to go over everything, and then you can try to explain to me why it's great, despite the fact that all right, I played Way of Mercy. So, yeah, it's great, at, so you already know. Yeah, At third level, you gain proficiencies in insight and medicine, and you gain proficiency with the herbalism kit. You also get a special mask, which... I mean, that's just for flavor text. I mean, you can... It's flavorful. Ask. It's yeah, got that cool. Plague Doctor vibe. But the really good thing is that you get two skills you're proficient in, and you get a tool that you become proficient in. And any time that you can become proficient in more in skills is always good. The Herbalism Kit probably isn't going to be the most used kit. And uh, what level is that, This Cody? is the third level. You're getting two Oh, as soon as you skills. hit third level. Huh, would yeah. you look at that? As yeah, choose... already looking better than everything else. As soon as you choose this subclass, you're already gaining two skills, which... And a uh, mask. Both of them are wisdom-based, if I'm not mistaken, and monks are a dex-based wisdom class, or you can't do strength-based monks, but it's more recommended to be a, a dex-wisdom-based monk. So with these two being wisdom-based skills, if I'm not mistaken, you become proficient in them, so they're going to be extremely high. You get two proficiencies, a kit, and a mask. You can, Might I add, you a get, mask. You can get a mask at as any other class in the game. This does yes, not make it but special. <laughs> in this way, it makes it feel special. You can't even, I mean, like some of them, like, you can get any mask. These are just the ones that D&D Beyond is giving you. You can choose... Any yes, but it want. makes it feel important. Yeah, so you could have a. It's kit just flavor mask. text, but it yeah. makes it feel important. And as well as third level, you get hand of healing and hand of harm. Healing allows you to spend a key point to touch a creature and restore a number of hit points equal to it, uh, equal to a roll of your martial arts die and your wisdom modifier. And you can also replace one of your strikes of flurry of blows to do this. So you can either use your action to heal a creature, or you can use flurry of blows to heal a creature. 
and it'll be wisdom modifier, which usually at this point you'd have like a wisdom modifier of like three, because it would be your second most important stat after dex usually. So you'd have. Then like you can a do the same thing to harm them. Yeah, and then harming would be that you deal necrotic damage. Is that when you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, you can expend uh, one key point to deal necrotic damage. Uh, equal to a roll of your martial arts dice plus your wisdom modifier. You can only use this one once per turn. So, do, you, do you deal uh, acid damage if you don't wash your hands? No, it is always necrotic. <laughs> so you can, uh, either one way, you can start healing with your key, which would be a d6 starting, and I think a d10 at max. I don't think you ever hit a d12 with your martial arts die. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, and or you can kill. And with your wisdom modifier. So starting, you basically get a d6 plus 3 of either healing or of damage to allies. So, what do you think of this, Jacob? As your third level gets. Uh, you get insight, medicine, the herbalism kit, a mask, you can heal allies of a your mask, martial arts, Jacob. of your a martial arts die plus wisdom, okay. or you can deal extra necrotic damage of your martial arts damage. Plague die Doctor, plus. Jacob. Here's my thing on it, okay? Plague doctor. I like the way of mercy as a whole Mm -hmm. But with this specific, the things that you're bringing up, I, I have to ask the question, why not just play a cleric? Get out. You get know? out. Leave. Get out. Leave. Do not come back. <laughs> We're no longer friends. Get out. How dare you? I mean, to be fair... Because as a, as, as a cleric, you can do the necrotic damage. You can still heal people. Um, but also, you don't have to roll to hit them think about it. when it comes to healing them. Like, uh, but think about it this way. Proficiency, insight, medicine... Which, Herbalism kit. Yeah, but herbs. Yeah, the cleric, but you get them from other already, yeah, too, right? The cleric can already get those. I know, but yeah. this makes it feel special. Yeah, but the strong thing with this one is that this is an additional. This is at third level. You're getting additional carotic and healing abilities. And to be fair, this one is is probably closer to a paladin with lay on hands being your healing and smite being your hand of harm. Yeah. So this yeah, one and you, is yeah, and I can see it. Like more towards but, that. But this one also you can use them on top of, uh, like, your healing ability can be, you can damage people and heal on the same turn, which is not something that the cleric can do, because it's either you cast a spell for healing, or you cast a spell or attack for damage. This one, you can do True. punch, punch with your flurry of blows, be the last attack of your flurry of blows can heal somebody, or you can... You can actually punch, do necrotic damage, punch with the sec with your first flurry of blows, heal with your second flurry of blows. So you can do extra damage and heal on the same turn by expending a little bit of key. And then eat True. your firstborn child. And then eat your firstborn child, if you'd like. If you so want to. Like. As, so as an action, yeah, you know? Yeah, so for what this... If you, want to, if you want to multi-class in the Warlock, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so this is Go definitely like a strong thing of getting two additional skills that are both wisdom-based and you're a wisdom-based character. The Herbalism Kit, I don't know how helpful the Herbalism Kit is really going to be off the top of my head, but... They'll definitely be. It, the it can be helpful with yeah. uh, situations where you need to heal people, bandage them up, whatever. Yeah. Um, but I guess I guess for me, right? My biggest thing is yes, it is really nice. I'm not denying that whatsoever. It just it doesn't really feel like a monk. Yeah, this doesn't you know? feel like when you think of a monk, you don't think of oh, I'm gonna heal, like I'm gonna do radiant and necrotic related right. things. You're thinking that you're going to be the punch multiple times, try to do as much damage as possible. Not, yeah, you're thinking oh, you're going to be Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee. Yeah, you know? I don't think Bruce Lee in any of his movies think. ever kicked his friend in the back of the head and healed him. Like, yes, but in this way, way, you not can. Not healed. Yeah, like this one gives like a very interesting thing, and this isn't like you know this isn't like the core way of you how you think of a monk, but this is making a way of how a monk can be seen. Which there are ways that this is in actual uh, traditional monk ways of uh there are actual traditions of you know acupuncture and uh, ways of like hitting pressure points to heal people. The necrotic damage is just D and D's way of doing that, but the radiant damage of healing. There are ways of monastic traditions being able to heal injuries by like you know hitting pressure points and stuff like that. That is actually a very like hand of healing is, is an actual way of monk. Hand of harm is something that you would do. It just I don't think that you talk to a, an actual monk and say, oh, when you do a hand of harm, are you causing necrotic damage to them? No, you're just hitting them in a nerve, right. like a bundle of nerves to do the extra damage. So it's just kind of giving right. a more uh, D&D-related way of how monks do things with necrotic and, radi and radiant. So it is actually a, a right. kind of cool thing you can do. 
And it is, it's like dependent on your wisdom, which your wisdom is already going to be somewhat decent and your martial arts die is going to be increasing the entire time. So I think at the end, it's a D10, if I'm not mistaken. So a D10 plus your wisdom, which, you know, at max level, a D10 plus four or five can be some pretty decent extra damage or healing. So nothing too bad there. Uh, at sixth level, you get Physician's Touch. You can uh, administer even greater cures with a touch, and if you feel it's necessary, you can use your knowledge to harm. When you use Hand of Healing on a creature, you can also end one disease or one of the following conditions affecting the creature. Blinded, deafened, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned. And when you use Hand of Harm on a creature, you can subject that creature to the poison condition until the end of your next turn. What do you think of this, Jamie? I think it's the best and that it's it's obviously should have been on the list because it's amazing. It's just because it's new. What about you, Jacob? What do you think of this as a 6th level ability? I think it's really nice. The fact that you can help your allies out. Like, um... <clears throat> okay, so... If you're playing this kind of monk, personally, I think you would be the kind of, you know... You kind of wanting to watch your tanks back, or like watch your, unironically, your wizards back, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, if anything was to happen to them, even your cleric, like whoever your main healer is, because I don't think that you'd be the main healer playing this class by any means. No, but uh, you do offer a type of versatility with support there. You can get rid of status effects, like being poisoned, deafened, blinded, whatever it is. Yeah, you, like, the cleric so, can be, like, the backline, like, cleric or druid can be, like, the backline big healer, while you can be the frontline right. uh, damager healer. Like, your cleric can be in the back, kind of casting a little bit of spells, healing, like, uh, you know, the fighter a whole lot, or can, like, kind of spread out to heal, like, the like a wizard or a bard or something, while you can be in the front line and, like, your fighter and barbarian and paladins, those guys wouldn't take a whole lot of damage, and their HP is so high... That, you know, you can basically, like, real quick give them a little bit of extra HP on top of the, what they already have. So you can really, like, be on the front line, as the monk should be, punching and dealing damage that way. And then, while you're on the front line, you can also heal. Because you have such, like, uh, like so much movement speed, you can easily weave between, you know, your fighter who's 20 feet away, run up and do something with him, attack a guy, run over to another ally, heal them, or, like, get rid of their poison condition... And then punch the guy that they're also punching, because of how much you can right. attack and how much you can uh, you can do, like how much you can move and how much you can attack. Being a monk, it really does True. like and, give a lot to what you can do as a monk. And even if you weren't healing them, like if they're underneath the petrified condition, because it is a status effect, you technically could just punch them out of the petrified condition. Uh, not the petrified condition. Only the if they're, if they're it, uh, blinded, definitely is paralyzed. Physical? Is blinded, oh, definitely okay. paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned. So, Petrify is its you, own okay. thing, but if they're in the middle of it... And they I thought it meant, like, any status effect. That was my fault. Yeah, it's um, useless, which, being able to get rid of Poisoned and stunned, stunned... Like, blind, like Deafened, mm -hmm. probably not going to happen too often. Poisoned and Stunned happen way more often than you'd really think. Paralyzed is very, like, rare to happen, but if it does happen, it's very serious. So, getting rid of that is very good, and same with Blinded, to where, like, it's a very serious thing, but doesn't happen all too often... So getting rid of that is also a very beneficial thing. And then with Hand of Harm, you can cause the poison condition on the enemy, which causes them to be a disadvantage until the end of your next turn. So it's not even the start of your next turn, it stops. You'll still gain any benefits that the poison condition gains until you end your turn. So it really can, like, spreading out everything that you can do. This is very beneficial, because this isn't like Hand of Healing, you either heal or you do one of these. It's You can heal the creature, and you can get rid of one of the conditions. And this one is, is that if you hit them with Hand of Harm, you'll deal the damage, and you can subject the creature to the poison condition. And like there isn't a saving throw like, oh, you can force them to have, make a saving throw, or they're poisoned. No, they're just straight up poisoned automatically by Hand of Harm. Which, kind of backing up what you said, can really be a battle changer, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you can really change the tide of battle depending on, especially if you are, you're really strategic, like your character's really strategic about who they're attacking. Yeah. You can definitely force the tides in your favor here. Yeah, and this is also something, like, not Hand of Harm, but Hand of Healing can be used outside of combat. 
So if you want your... Because I believe you get uh, your key points back at a short rest, if I'm not mistaken. You can basically... You can... Like, if your allies were affected by one of these conditions, rather than having your cleric use a spell slot to cast Lesser Restoration, you can let them save that, uh, cure them with Hand of Healing, and then take a short rest to gain everything back. Exactly. So you were like a very versatile, quick-paced, uh, minor healer for different things, and you're a uh, quick-paced minor debuffer as well. So as a 6th level ability, this is definitely one of the better ones you can do. And then next up at 11th level is Flurry of Healing and Harm. You can now meet out a Flurry of Comfort and Hurt. When you use Flurry of Blows, you can now replace each of the unarmed strikes with a use of Hand of Healing without spending key points for the healing. In addition, when you make an unarmed strike with Flurry of Blows, you can use Hand of Harm with that strike without spending the key point for Hand of Harm. You can still only use Hand of Harm once per turn, but you can now basically uh, have Flurry of Blows just automatically use Hand of Healing and... Or you can have uh, you can have Flurry of Blows be able to have one of them do Hand of Harm instead of using it as an action, or using it on top of a, a hit using a key point. It's now for free as long as you Flurry of Blows. And if you really need to heal an ally, you can replace all of Flurry of Blows with Hand of Healing. Yeah, and you can loop that back into just regular monk stuff you get, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes really, really nice that you can do that. Um... Again, this is a very combat-oriented class, but it, it is it seems to be very consistent so far with what it can do. Yeah, it is a it's definitely not like trying to throw you all over the place. Like, you know, the Cobalt Soul was very about like getting information, helping your allies out, knowing vulnerabilities, forcing vulnerabilities, forcing you know right. aid to your allies. This one is all about uh, helping your allies out by either healing them, getting rid of uh, ailments to them, uh, doing extra damage to the enemies, and being able to uh, do things with Floria Blows instead of on top of actions that you're already doing. You're already going to be doing Floria Blows, so you can now, like, get additional benefits from those things. Exactly. And that that so far has been the nicest thing about the class, is the fact that there's so much you can do. Yes, it is pretty much just combat. I mean, outside of the proficiencies you get, but... It is very versatile within combat, and that's what's really nice about it. Yeah, because the Monk is a very combat-oriented class, so getting more things you can do in combat, and it's not just like, oh, more like, you know, other ways to use your key, like, oh, I can use my key to knock the enemy prone, I can use my key to, I mean, knocking them prone is good, but like, pushing them 15 ba feet back, making them, you know, like, these kind of like, not useless, but like, smaller time things, like, you'll probably be using Hand of Healing and Hand of Harm, quite a bit when doing things compared to like how often would you be trying to push an enemy 15 feet back in certain ways or like other things that some of the other subclasses give for additional things that you can spend with key you'll definitely right. be using healing and harm way more than you'd probably think just by reading them like putting this character into practice you'd probably be surprised at how often you'd be saying Oh, I use Flurry of Blows. I use one of the Flurry of Blows to heal myself, and then the second one I hit, and with that hit, I'm using Hand of Harm to then do more damage. So you healed yourself on a turn, and you're dealing a lot of damage on the turn. Right. So, it is definitely something that, when you read it, it may not sound like it's the strongest thing ever, but putting it into practice, this is actually an extremely good class. So... And at uh, 17th level, as the subclass is Capstone, you get Hand of Ultimate Mercy. Your Mastery of Life Energy opens the door to the Ultimate Mercy. As an action, you can touch the corpse of a creature that died within the past 24 hours and expend 5 key points. The creature then returns to life, regaining a number of hit points equal to 4d10 plus your wizard modifier. If the creature, while, uh, if the creature died while subject to any of the following condition, conditions, it revives them with them removed. Blinded, deafened, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned, and you can't do this again until you finish a long rest. So you basically get to revive somebody who's died within 24 hours. Yeah, so basically once a day you can resurrect your ally for free, unlike the wizard. Yeah, once a day you can just go up, spend 5 <laughs> key points that you get back really easily, and just, you know, clear. I do that every day, it's not that hard. Just sacrifice a firstborn. 
Yeah, but this one you don't have to sacrifice a firstborn. Adamature. How many firstborns? Are you saying you wouldn't want to sacrifice a firstborn? No, I'm saying this one you don't have to. So you can sacrifice a firstborn mm -hmm. and do this. Yeah, but that's a waste of a good firstborn, you know? Yeah, like, so I, I, I can still get something to out there, you know? You can still sacrifice a firstborn, but you can also... Yeah, but, get you know, what else would I want out of the day? Like, what, what am I going to use the firstborn for? It seems like a waste. I don't know. Maybe getting good creases with the god? Chicken nuggets? Nah, screw the gods. I only call them when I want them. Twitch one sauce. Twitch one sauce. That's all you need. Boom. But honestly, like, as a capstone, like, this isn't something that, like, you know, you get to 14th level and the campaign ends. This isn't like a, oh, damn, I never got to get to 17th level. I never got to, like, use Hand of Ultimate Mercy. But this also isn't something that you're like, oh, I'm at 17th level and this is what I get. No, like, this is something that, like, you're not too disappointed that you missed. But this also isn't something that you're, like, upset that you got. So, like, this is definitely something that is, like, in that good milling ground where, like, you can use it inside yeah. and outside of combat to be able to, you know, you can heal your, like, you can revive your ally who just died in the middle of combat. You can, you know, hit him with that. Or you can be outside of it combat. Makes... Maybe you lost, you don't have any key points left or you don't have five key points. You can, you know, take your short can... rest, take your long rest, and then you can revive them. Yeah, it can also be really good for, like, a... BBEG, you just got to the level, you know, it's about to be a total party kill. You and maybe, like, your fighter or barbarian paladin, whoever is still up. And maybe you can revive the cleric, or the druid, or the wizard. Yeah, somebody... You know, who, and you can... Yeah, who can also heal, or can also uh, revivify. Maybe you revive your, you know, your level 17 bard who knows uh, Wish, and then he just casts a Wish for you, and it just saves the day, because... I don't know if you know this, guys, but Wish is really overpowered. <laughs> like that's that's a video all to itself to talk about Wish. Still depends on the DM, though. Oh yeah, but also like it also isn't like some revivification where it's like oh they're revivified, they have one HP, you know they have they can't like they're you know fatigued, you know they're through like, levels of exhaustion or something like that. No, you f revive them to four D ten plus wisdom, so you can get. You know, like a minimum of nine, but probably like I think it's an average of twenty-six HP for, like healed onto them, and depending on who you just healed, that is probably a pretty decent one. Like if you put that onto a fighter who can either use um, second wind to heal themselves, a barbarian who even with twenty-six HP, that's essentially like forty-two, depending on which type of uh, rage they have. Like a totem bar, like a bear totem barbarian, with twenty-six HP is. Probably more HP than your clear, than your wizard will ever have. <laughs> so it's like depending that's on like, who that's you. That's unfair. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, like it depends on who you revive. Like you revive the cleric if you need, yeah. like if you can tell, like if you're fighting the BBEG and you know that they have like a lot of HP left, you probably want to get the cleric up so that they can, you know, try to heal more, revive people more. No. If you're if they're at like a very low HP, you might want to get like the barbarian or the fighter up who can then, you know, get four attacks in as a fighter and just start murdering them or get your barbarian up to help tank a bit longer. Like, if your cleric is up See, and you just need your tank back. I meant more so in the sense of, I feel like it's unfair to compare uh, a bear, bear totem barbarian to a wizard's health. Well, no, this is like, so, like a bear totem barbarian maybe. with 26 HP even at a max age wizard, oh, like a max yeah. HP wizard, that twenty six HP bear totem barbarian will live longer than your wizard at max level. <laughs> like, when you're resistant to everything other than psychic damage, you're <laughs> you're not dying. But your wizard who has two, like an AC of two, they're going to die. <laughs> so, uh, did Jamie just leave, or was that you, Jacob? No, it was Jacob. He died. No, he died. Okay. Oh, he's alive! He's back. All right. So, definitely, like, overall, you know, this is, like, a very, like, healing-oriented, very strong to be in the middle of combat more than outside of combat, but can still be good outside of combat with their with his healing abilities. Uh, where would you two rank this? Excellent. Legendary. Put it up there. Legendary. What about you, Jacob? Where would you rank this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so not as much roleplay, but you could definitely make it through a dungeon crawler pretty much any campaign you put it into. 
So I mean, it really at that point, it's just up to you with the role playing stuff. I could, I, could, I would get the class itself legendary, um, just on the basis that, that you're so versatile in combat and in general with all the monk stuff you already get. So yeah, that that's where I put it. If not legendary, I'd put it like at high grade. I I would definitely say that for the fact that it has more unique and it has a lot of things that can be used inside of outside of combat and used in multiple campaigns it i would say that it is better than the cobalt soul because the cobalt soul is very dependent on uh what your allies can do and you know it's kind of like when yeah. like will every single one of your the pieces that you get from way of the cobalt soul be able to be used in every session if not every other session every session you're going to be able to use what the like what you're getting from the way of mercy Cobalt's uh, Way of right. Mercy monk subclass. But you probably, like, every session, every other session, you probably aren't going to be, you know, trying to extract truth or uh, learning about enemy vulnerabilities and stuff like that from the third level of ability. So there probably yeah. isn't as often. Like, the Cobalt Soul, what it can do is phenomenal. It's just not everything is going to be used as often as you know, as it could like, be, or as it can be to be as good as uh, it can be. I guess, in in all seriousness, uh, how I kind of look at this class on a scale of, like, 1 to 100, I would give it, like, a solid, like, 93 to 95, mm -hmm. like, area, like, maybe, like, 94, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas Cobalt Soul, uh, like, comparing it to this, at least, I would put it right around, like, 88 to 89% range. Yeah. Like, not quite there. Like, I'd even be willing to to go as far as saying, this class is great, but Cobalt Soul would be closer to uh, to nice. Yeah, like right? if this, like if we did put Mercy as great, then you like we couldn't say that you know like how I was saying at Cobalt Soul when we first talked about it was eighty nine to ninety one. If we did put this one in Legendary, then automatically you take away the lead like the ninety one and ninety that Cobalt Soul could get, and you drop to like an eighty nine, eighty eight, like you said. And if we put Mercy in great. You pretty you pretty much throw the Cobalt Soul all the way down to like eighty three, eighty two range. Yeah, true. And I would still be willing to give it like a high eighty five, like in the right environment. Yeah, in the but right. I, time. The more the more I kind of compare it to the other classes, I just it's really good, but is it as good as the other monk subclass? Yeah, because you if know? you're looking at it like if the Cobalt Soul was the only one you had, yeah, it's really alert, good. best class, best subclass. There is no better. Than Mercy? No. Never. Like, this one is definitely, like, I'm going to put it in Legendary in, like, the 92 to 94 range. And then that yeah. would kind of put the, the Cobalt Soldier, like, the 89, 88 range. They don't, both of them don't have a little picture. So they would go, you know, if you were to see them, it would be right, you know, they would go right here and uh, uh, Mercy would go right here, Soul would go right there. You put Battlemaster as Legendary? Battlemaster, fighter, battlemaster is the best subclass. Bro, superiority die is yeah, pretty, pretty much. <laughs> like, yeah, they don't get quite as much as the other fighters do, but what you get from the you can be a Pokemon master. Yeah, like what you get from maneuvers is insane. <laughs> I made a Pokemon right. master. It was great. No, uh, with circle of the Beast master. I managed to befriend a dragon, and I named it Charizard. <laughs> oh, it right. was an ice dragon, which right. makes it more funny. So we'll probably just go over those oh. two. Uh, Jacob, if you'd like to join me another time, uh, sometime this week, to go over more of yeah. the monk subclasses, then you're more than welcome to. If you don't want to, then I'll just go over the rest of the monks uh, later just on this week. Just let me know, man. Yeah, so I'll, I'll let you know to talk more about monks. Jamie, um, it was nice having you. Uh, <laughs> you did. Jamie, uh, nice wow. having you here. Don't come back. I mean, you didn't. Uh, I mean, <laughs> made a mistake inviting you. Uh, I mean, I didn't expect. I never want to see you again. I didn't expect you to try to derail the video, but no, I didn't. I kept it on the tracks the entire time. So, but that'll do it for this video. If you guys did enjoy, then consider hitting the like button and commenting down below what you guys did enjoy to so that I can continue doing it to continue making the videos as well as I have been. If comment wanted, that James is the best and should come back. If you guys didn't like the video, again, go ahead and dislike it and comment down below what you didn't like so that I can improve upon it to uh, make the videos better for y'all. If you guys want to know when I upload, then the best way to know is by subscribing. But that does it for this video. Uh, until next time, bye guys.